Do you ever find yourself caught in a cycle of self-doubt? Feeling like you have to prove your worth or constantly adjusting to fit in? That's shame at work. And here's the thing. It's running the show more than you think, impacting how you connect with others and how you see yourself. Today, we're gonna to unpack the defenses we use to protect ourselves from shame and how they keep us from living fully and authentically. Understanding these patterns is key to breaking free and reclaiming your life. So let's dive in. Hey everyone, how's it going? I'm Kira Wackett. Thanks for joining me for another video as we work to empower and equip you with the confidence and skills to write your own story so that you can live your life on purpose. Today we're talking defenses. More specifically, the defenses we employ as a result of our shame. Shame, or the fear of disconnection and not belonging, is rooted in our core belief that we're inherently not good enough or worthy of love. Others are but we aren't. As such, the rules are different for us. The expectations are higher. Who we have to be and how we have to show up in the world follows a different set of standards. Now, this sounds ridiculous and unfair, and in many ways, tied to our ego. I mean, we all see that, right? We believe both that yet we're the worst and have to be the best to be able to stand in the same room as other people. And yet here we are. And the funny thing is, shame thinks it's being helpful. It thinks that by taking over our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, it can help us combat this threat. It says, if you just follow my rules, no one's going to see you as less than. We can hide our true selves in favor of the performance and thereby re-secure our connection. But we can all see how this plays out and likely have been living it for many years. Instead of creating a sense of security, it reinforces our insecurity relying on external cues, motivation, and validation to guide our behaviors, rather than focusing on self-efficacy, our intrinsic worth, and the beliefs and values that root us to ourselves. We become insecure, having difficulty engaging in interpersonal relationships, experience increased symptoms of depression and anxiety, and ultimately can lose ourselves in a spiral of shame-based thinking, feeling, and behaving. Now, as you can imagine, this experience can create a lot of tension. Essentially, you swing back and forth from brief bouts of relief when you feel like you've lived up to every expectation and norm, almost immediately overshadowed by panic, fear, and frustration, both afraid that you're never going to be able to maintain the performance or finding new flaws and cracks to try and cover up. There's no rooting to yourself, only the promise of a lifelong chase for fleeting moments of false security. Now in this, our body can react from a place of desperation. This is the riskiest place to be, when we fear a crack is or could be exposed. And as a result, shame's created an interpersonal defense system so that in these moments, we can protect against judgment and rejection. Or at least we think we are. Now before I go into each of these three defenses, I want to note that each of us engages in all of them. You might see yourself in one more than others or notice that you have a primary response depending on the setting, but none of us are immune to these responses. That doesn't make you weak, that doesn't make you bad or mean. Even though as you learn about these strategies, your shame is going to try and add more shame to the mix. These are natural responses to a perceived threat. These responses are often enacted without volition, and their goal is to try and combat the threat shame encounters in that moment. In talking about this, we're actively working to make space to recognize when and how these show up for you so that you can begin the work of recognizing these responses and learning to develop different behavioral response patterns that are less influenced by shame. Okay, what are these things? The first of the three is called moving towards. Now, the moving towards response is basically you become a people pleaser, a human giver. Your job is about giving your whole self to everyone else, securing connection by being of service to their wants and needs. You're constantly deconditioning yourself out of any wants or needs. They would be an inconvenience to others and might cause them to leave. Your sense of self becomes rooted in what you do for other people rather than in who you are. The second defense is called moving away. 
So you'll notice here we're talking about our shifts and patterns, moving towards, now moving away. Now in moving away, you believe that genuine connection is impossible or will inevitably falter. And as such, you take yourself out of the running before the race even begins. You isolate or avoid. You disengage. You might be doing all the things, but you find yourself in a state of detachment as you go. You minimize any investment of self or hope that connection can exist. This can look similar to moving towards in that you make everything about others and minimize personal investment or vulnerability, but the goal here is less about trying to build others up and more about protecting them from connecting to you in any real way. This way it'll hurt less when they leave or let you down, which shame has already guaranteed in your mind will happen. Now as a note, it's not uncommon to use substances such as food, alcohol, and other drugs, or behaviors like scrolling through social media, sleep, binging Netflix, as a means of disconnection or avoidance. Now the final one that we're gonna talk about is called moving against. So again, we've done moving towards, moving away, and now moving against. When we feel shame or a possible threat to connection, we react with anger in this defense, slinging shame towards everyone around us. This more desperate shame response aims to bring everyone down. It's anchored in the belief that no way are you gonna be able to have value or power unless you strip it away from everyone else so you're all at the bottom. Over time, it often leads to greater feelings of shame because we're hurting those around us and become very isolated. It creates a power imbalance and rather than making space for everyone to be seen, we end up casting shadows onto others and perpetuating others' shame spirals. Now again, I wanna reiterate that not only are these things universal, but they are inevitable. You have, are, or will act from all three of these places in your life when you feel shame. So as we wrap for today, I want you to spend some time both giving yourself grace and space to say that you do this and that you're not a bad person, but instead a human trying to move through a painful experience. And two, I want you to dive deeper into trying to understand when, with who, where, and why these strategies present themselves. Who do you find yourself people-pleasing with? Who are you more combative and angry with? Why might that be? Do you tend to start in one of these roles and then pivot throughout relationships? Are there certain roles or relationships that you find yourself constantly playing a specific role? Why? Where does that come from? Now, if you're ready, you can take this even a little bit deeper and you can ask yourself, where does your shame get its legs? What beliefs or judgments about yourself would you have to let go of to begin to dismantle the hold your shame has on you? What fears do you have about letting go of the performance? Now in particular here, I want you to consider that first role, moving towards, as this is where a lot of us find ourselves, at least in the beginning of a relationship or a role. What would you fear would happen if you stopped playing that part? If you stopped being the person that did everything or took care of everyone? Be sure to let us know in the comments what came up for you as you went through each of these different defenses. Consider an action step that you can take or a thought you're gonna let go of. What does it look like for you as you do this? And of course, if you have questions or needs that I can offer any support around, please don't hesitate to let me know. Now, if you found today's episode valuable and insightful, I encourage you to hit that thumbs up, click subscribe, and of course, please share this video with someone you think could benefit from hearing it. If you're ready to take that next step in your own shame resilience journey, be sure to click the link in the show notes to download my free handout, five things shame resilient people do every day and three things they don't. And if you're looking for more ways to connect, you'll find links to my website, email list, and podcast below, as well as a link to set up a discovery call to go over any questions you have about program offerings or your next steps in your shame resilience journey. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Remember, you have the right to author your own story. So let's go get that pen back. I'll see you next time.